Okay, hello and welcome everyone. So in this video, I'm going to be discussing applications of economics to advertising in a way that's relevant for our entrepreneur. So previously, what we've talked about is different types of advanced pricing strategies that we might implement if you've got a firm with some degree of market power, which hopefully our entrepreneur does. So assuming that you've got the ability to price like a monopolist, maybe you're able to end up pricing a little bit more cleverly in in terms of like implementing some type of first degree price discrimination where you'd be given personalized prices, second degree price discrimination where consumers would choose from a menu of prices and all consumers would just kind of self sort into which package is right for them, or third degree price discrimination where you'd have different prices based on essentially your assessment of differences in uh, willingness to pay or price elasticity demand. Then we talked about two part tariff. We talked about bundling. It's kind of ways to operationalize second degree price discrimination a little bit differently. We talked about dynamics. Now what we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, well, there's a lot of interesting ways that our entrepreneur can work to generate profits by acting on the in terms of innovations on the pricing side. Now, what type of non price related strategies could we implement that are going to end up boosting profits? And so here we'll talk about advertising. In the next lecture note, we'll talk about product design. And the idea would be we want to think about the different sorts of ways that we can affect our demand curve using things other than price, right? So the idea is maybe there's some of these important determinants of demand. Think about all the important demand shifters. Well, number of buyers, tastes and preferences of consumers, consumer income, prices of related products, expectations about future prices. Some of those are controllable by our entrepreneur or by our firm. Some of them just simply aren't. But the ones that you are able to influence, maybe you can influence via advertising, and that's the idea. And then realizing that there's some determinants of our demand curve we're able to influence, let's just think of in terms of like the economic logic, what we're trying to do. Well, I mean, other things equal, you wanna make your demand more inelastic, you wanna make the demand curve more vertical, and you'd like to increase the size of the market, you'd like to have the most possible people buying. And so those are the kind of two effects. What can we do to influence our demand? Well, through promotion and advertising, clearly, and this is going to hopefully maybe change the number of buyers, maybe increase the number of buyers in the market. If you think about the, the shape of the demand curve, this should extend our horizontal access. Or you can think of the horizontal intercept as representing the size of the market. Just think for a second. So I've got a different video in terms of breaking down supply and demand and kind of giving this in, important in, intuitive overview to the demand curve. But just real briefly, you think of the height of the demand curve as the willingness to pay to the marginal consumer. The vertical intercept of the demand curve would therefore be the maximal willingness to pay or essentially the maximal willingness to pay for the first person in the market, right? And so that'd be like the highest anybody would pay for like that first unit or for the like just slightly greater than zero, whatever fractional amount you'd be able to produce. The horizontal intercept is going to correspond to the size of the market. If we just think for a second about a demand curve that involves people buying at most one unit of the good, then the quantity is going to equal the number of buyers. And so you could think of what's the amount of people that would accept the good if it were free. Now, that's interesting. So on the one hand, like you think of the horizontal intercept of the demand curve as corresponding to a price of zero. And so indeed, that should be like the size of the market. That's the most you could give away for free. But I want to say that really kind of carefully because we realize as soon as we actually start giving things away for free, there's a lot of people who would accept something for free who would not pay a penny for it. Right. There's this sort of important distinction and there's something interesting around things being free. And that's actually important for entrepreneur thinking about generating a market, building a market and getting exposure to the product, uh, generating demand by virtue of giving away some units for free. There's like an interesting story historically about Gillette razor blades. It did kind of exactly that. Anyway, so we want to influence our demand. We want to increase the, the vertical intercept and increase the horizontal intercept. And other things equal, this is going to lead to, well, an increase in demand, which may or may not be an exactly parallel shift of our demand curve. Of course, in practice, it's probably not. If anything, though, we'd want the demand curve to rotate probably in a way that's going to lead to more inelastic demand. All right, the other thing we can do is we can think about product design. That's going to influence our demand by affecting the responsiveness of our customers to changes in prices relative to related goods, like substitutes and complements. So product design is going to be really important for determining the, the specific niche and to think of how many close substitutes there are for your product. 
the other thing obviously for product design is going to be relevant in terms of like the quality of the product how much people are going to be willing to pay for the thing and so that's a, that's another important aspect all right so we want to think about different types of advertising how it can influence demand firstly firstly we think of demand we think of advertising as providing information so especially if you have a new product it could just simply be you're letting customers know the product exists in the first place you're kind of telling some of the important good making features of the product the important characteristics the other aspect of it of advertising would be the persuasion aspect so now you've got images you've got associations that are going to hopefully differentiate and distinguish your product from that of rivals maybe you want to say oh this was you know this is the if you really want X item this is the true legitimate version of X not some cheap knockoff or something like that now obviously like even though I've delineated clearly between providing information and persuasion those obviously that's a porous border and any type of advertising is probably gonna have both of these elements in it but we kind of distinguish between those kind of key features in doing so, we want to think about the important characteristics of the product, some of which are easily communicated to consumers, others that aren't. And I'm drawing a distinction here between search and experience characteristics. I want to talk about a third category, a little bit of an interlude after this part. I'll talk about it before we get to the next slide. Then I'll go back to the search and experience distinction. So search characteristics are those that you can just Google, right? You can look on the label of the product. You can figure out without having purchased it. You just think of like, what are the features of the product? Those are the, those are the search characteristics of the product, such as like horsepower, or megahertz, calorie, style, price, uh, building materials, whatever is, you know, is it made out of glass or plastic? What, you know, whatever is the, whatever is the container, you know, all these types of things are characteristics that you can find out before making the purchase. Experience characteristics are basically those things that you can't learn without having used the product. And so this is actually really important for information goods. This is why New York Times and, and, um, and iTunes will give like samples of the music or sample five free articles or whatever, because you don't necessarily know your, the value of that particular good until you've experienced it. So these are, these are your experience characteristics, things that consumers can't ascertain prior to purchase. And then we can think about how easy it is or how difficult it is to communicate these things via advertising. A third category that I want to introduce, I wanna just mention real quick, is the idea of credence characteristics. So a credence good, a credence good is one where the consumer does not know what quality of the product they need, nor do they know the quality of the product they've received, or like what level of the good they've received, nor what level of the good they, they, they actually need. So examples of credence goods would be like car repairs. You go to a mechanic, they tell you you need a major fix, they do something to it, they charge you for a major fix. Well, you don't know if your car actually needed a major fix or not, nor do you know if they actually did this expensive procedure or just billed you for it. Same thing with medical care. Same thing actually in the case of where there's some type of expert knowledge. Like if you go into, if you go into like a high-end photography store, or if you go into a high-end like computer store, and you're looking at different different models of a of a new laptop or different models of a camera. Well, presumably the salesperson has a much better ability to ascertain the true value that you would need relative to your prospective uses than you would, because you just unless you unless you are yourself an expert. Also, after they've made the sale, you know, they, they know what they've charged you for and they know what level of quality you've, you've received, but you very well may not. And the point is, any time you've got, well, search characteristics, that's really easy to communicate con to consumers and consumers know that, they can go verify. Experience characteristics, that's really difficult for consumers to verify, and so they're gonna be a little bit suspicious of that type of advertising, and we'll kind of see those implications. Credence characteristics, even more so, because now there's this sort of ample scope for possible fraud, and so it's actually difficult to overcome in the case of credence goods without absent third-party verification oftentimes. All right, so going back to thinking about experience characteristics, one proclamation companies might want to make is our product tastes great. And then the question is, are consumers likely to believe the statement? Well, typically, probably not. And it can be for a variety of reasons. I mean, one is obviously you're not going to make the advertisement that your product tastes bad. And so consumers are going to see are going to expect that everybody says that they've got this wonderful tasting product. It's kind of like the it's kind of like the 
um, the advertising characteristic of deluxe. So you go look in, on, on the box and it says like this is deluxe paper towels or deluxe paper plates or deluxe. And I never quite know what deluxe means other than it seems to be, as far as I know, near as I can tell, just a throwaway term. And so it just seems like you got to put it on the box. It reminds me of kind of like uh, Tommy Boy, um, the movie Tommy Boy with you know Chris Farley um, and, uh, and how you have to have a guarantee, you can have a guarantee on the brake pads box. Um, anyway, so it can be really difficult to advertise experience characteristics, given that people aren't likely going to believe whatever is this whatever is this proclamation because everybody's going to say it tastes great. Now, there's some interesting ways that this can we can get some reinforcement, obviously. So, if there is a shadow of a future, right? If the future is relevant, if there can be repeat purchases or if there could be word of mouth, now you've got a situation where you there is some gain to veridically revealing that your product is good to saying our product is good proclaiming you've got a good product and then people in the future can reinforce and say oh yeah this is a good product right and so now there's this enhanced value to touting the high quality and this makes the product's taste or quality a little bit more likely to be uh, believable Interestingly, we're expecting, well, the great tasting products, the advertising that this is the case, is going to generate, well, the immediate term sales, right? People are going to buy immediately, but then also in the future, right? Future sales as well, because you could get these repeat purchases where people now develop a habit around the product, or they hear from other customers and they're like, oh yeah, no, this is a good product. This is the one you want to buy. In the case of bad tasting products, the advertising is typically just going to generate only current sales. Now, I'm not talking about advertising in general. I mean the advertising that your product tastes great. If you say your product tastes great and it tastes bad, you're probably going to, it's sort of like the fool me once, fool me twice thing, right? And so here you've got a situation where you're going to be able to generate increased, increased sales in the immediate term as people believe for a second that the product tastes great, then they realize that it's not. Interestingly, of course, that could be detrimental to future sales. If it turns out that people feel bad for having been fooled, now they go and tell everybody, no, don't, don't trust them. This is actually a, a terrible product. Anyway, this situation gives rise to some, an application of signaling theory. So we can get a signaling equilibrium. Now, the idea with signaling is you've got this some unobservable trait that one side of the market, in this case, the seller observes. And they're trying to convey this information about this underlying characteristic of their product to customers. They do this by sending a signal. And the issue is how close does that signal track with the true underlying characteristic? If it's the case that only the good quality product sends the good quality signal and the bad quality product sends the bad quality signal or no signal at all, now you've got a peer separating equilibrium. Right? And so then the, the signal is veridical. You can tell the true quality on the basis of the signal alone. And that would tend, that tend to be more likely to be the case if it is costly to fake, if it's difficult for the bad version to pretend to be the good version. Now you can also get a semi-separating equilibrium. The semi-separating equilibrium is where, yeah, the good quality product says that they're good quality, and most of the time, or a lot of the time, maybe that signal is accurate, but the bad quality product also says that they're good quality. Therefore, with some probability, with some likelihood, when you see the good quality signal, it might not necessarily be a good quality product underneath. That's the semi-separating equilibrium. So anyway, what we're looking for is with, with, with the signal of sending a good quality, is that you've got a good quality product, is a situation where you're conveying something that's difficult for the bad quality product to feign or to, to, or to fake and or costly in the sense of like maybe there's reputational concerns and if there are product reviews or you can advertise your past product reviews or word of mouth or something like this, now it becomes even more difficult for the bad quality product to fake and you're more likely to get the true peer separating equilibrium. Although in reality you wouldn't, I mean, in reality, most signaling equilibria are going to look a little bit more like the semi-separating equilibrium. Anyway, so here I say the signaling equilibrium is where the good tasting products advertises more and customers interpret this high level of advertising as a signal of the good taste because there's increased returns to advertising that you've got the good quality product. And so if you see high frequency advertising, maybe especially what could be looked at as otherwise frivolous advertising, you're more likely to actually have underlying uh, good qualities of, for the product than for the bad quality product. Although, I don't know, I've got my own pessimism here because 
I don't know, anecdotally, the movies that I've seen advertised on TV, you know, if you see a mo an advertisement for a movie on TV, a large number of cases, I don't know if this is as true today, I, don't, I haven't seen a movie in a long, long time, like decades, but when I was younger, and you'd see advertisements for movies on TV, you knew that that was a bad movie. And so, uh, so I don't know, maybe this, so we take this sort of, as always in the course, take everything a little bit with a grain of salt. All right, I've got my, I've got my awesome AirPod because I'm doing kind of two setups here trying to record this video two ways just in case, just in case the first one fails again. All right, so now let's talk about the demand function. I've written down demand as a function of price and advertising. And what this will do is this is going to allow us to be able to come up with the optimal level of price or optimal price and the optimal level of advertising. So here I'm going to drop this into our firm's profit maximization expression. And they're gonna, we're going to think of the firm trying to maximize profit, revenues minus production costs minus advertising costs, by choosing the optimal price and choosing the optimal advertising level. Here we're thinking of A as like advertising, dollars spent on advertising. This would be like your weekly budget on Google AdWords or something like this. And you know, P is just the price of the product. So if we're trying to find the optimal pricing and optimal advertising level, we're thinking of derivative. The firm's taking the derivative, they're differentiating profit with respect to price. That'll give them the optimal price after we solve the first order condition. And with respect to advertising, this will give us the optimal advertising after we solve. And interestingly, this is gonna actually boil down to something a little bit different than you might be anticipating. Look, if you remember, we've got this nice relationship between the percentage markup and the inverse, the reciprocal of the price elasticity of demand. And this gave us the nice interpretation that the more inelastic, the fewer the close substitutes, the less responsive to price is demand, the higher the markup. And we had this nice, easily, readily interpretable expression that came as a result of our prox uh, uh, you know manipulating our profit maximization decision i'll be able to do something relatively similar with a little bit more manipulation but equally interpretable relative to advertising so that's the goal of the next three slides or so so here's just reminding us a couple slide uh, in the um, in the advanced pricing lecture i go over this derivation so i'm actually not going to go back over this again remember you're just taking a partial chain rule solving being a little bit clever manipulating and then getting getting something you can kind of see it right here dq dp and then and then q over p if i if i multiply through by uh, the reciprocal will have dp dq q over p and now you've got something that looks eh, starts to look a little bit like price elasticity demand turns out it's the inverse of price elasticity demand so we'll just make that we'll just make that replacement eta here is just price elasticity of demand which we've previously used epsilon for we're going to do something similar next so now let's take the derivative take the partial with respect to advertising right so i'm going to do that here same application chain rule sort of thing and if you if you go ahead and if we first we'll take the derivative here this is obviously this p comes along for the ride this is going to be dq da then i'm going to take the derivative here it's going to be dc dq dq da and then this minus one that was just from this right here from this a and then equals zero because it's my first order condition then what i did is i factored out a dq da and that left me with p minus mc why well here is the p and then dc dq that's marginal cost Okay, so now I've got this expression. Let's just pause on this. I'm going to bring this to the next, to the top of the next slide, and we're going to say, "Oh, wait a second. Let's try. Let's try to make an, an elasticity, an elasticity between demand and advertising. And if we do that, to be able to make this into an advert into elasticity, I'm going to need an a over q here. And if I want the percentage markup, I need to be dividing through by p." So actually, why don't I look at this one right here? What if I multiply both sides by A over PQ, by advertising as a share of revenue? So if I do that, you know, here's the A, here's the A. So I multiply both sides by A, and then here's the PQ, here's the PQ. Okay, good. So that preserves the equality, and now we've actually got something we can interpret pretty readily. This right here, this is my percentage markup. Why don't I just actually replace that? Sorry, with this right here, right? Price minus marginal cost divided by price. Uh, well, that was one over eta minus one over eta. So I'll just do that right here. And this is actually going to give me this nice expression, right? Epsilon A, this, this is the advertising elasticity. And so this is going to give me advertising elasticity divided by original price elasticity demand is equal to the proportion of advertising to sales. That's awesome, right? This is going to give us something that we can easily interpret. 
So here we have advertising elasticity, here we have price elasticity demand, here we have advertising as a fraction of sales. And notice we can interpret this actually relative to just mathematically or relative to the economic intuition. So if we think mathematically, why does advertising increase adver why does advertising spending increase as advertising effectiveness increase? Well, look, as if it, if it's more effective, you you're going to do more of it, right? Well, in terms of the mathematics, as the advertising elasticity gets bigger, this numerator gets bigger to preserve this equality, we need this side to get bigger as well. Why does A increase when demand becomes more inelastic? Well, if this gets smaller, this overall fraction gets larger. To make this larger, well, there's two things that could happen. We could make sales smaller, but we don't want to do that. Or we could make advertising larger. That's why A increases when demand becomes more inelastic. You advertise more to capitalize on the fact that you've got, you can increase the, you can increase the belief in consumers' mind that there's relatively few substitutes for your product. Why might ad levels be higher for a new product? Uh, well, if we have a new product, you know, maybe for instance, we have more elastic demand. The other thing is we might, we certainly have a situation where sales are small, at least starting off. And so advertising is going to be a larger fraction and for, um, it's going to be a larger fraction of sales, at least when, at least initially. All right. So now I want to do a little bit of analysis. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to walk through an example thinking about how we might estimate our advertising elasticity of demand. I'm going to embed this in the context of this Harvard case study and I'm just going to do two things. First, the point of this is to talk about how you might actually go about estimating the advertising elasticity of demand for your product. And the other part is showing us this application of econometrics, you know, from the econometrics course. All right, so here's a Harvard case study. We're talking about an over-the-counter pain-killing arthritis drug called No Pain, going back to 1992. So No Pain had been one of the four leading drugs in the market, the sort of nice oligopoly with 15% market share, and they were interested in expanding their advertising campaign via television. Well, in this case, you probably realize this can be sort of a large expenditure, and we want to do some experimentation to determine how best to spend these funds. So we want to think of what ad copy, what verbiage is going to be the most effective, how much advertising should be done, and then how are the competitors going to respond? I mean, obviously you've got an oligopoly, and so we expect oligopoly firms are going to respond to the actions of their rivals. All right, so here is the setup. We've got 24 sales territories over six months. We've got two advertising copy, two versions of ad copy. We've got the emotional and we've got rational. And we've got three levels of advertising expenditure per 100 potential customers to consider. So this is our ad dollars variable. It make more sense when I show the equation in a second. Ad dollars can take on a value of 250, 475, or eight dollars. I'll do my analysis at 475, and you can think of how we could take this very same example and extend it on your own to 250 or to eight dollars. So I'll leave that as an exercise for for you to do on your own. All right, so. Also, we recorded competitor, or they, I wasn't part of this, 19, in 1992. In 1992, I had, I had fewer, fewer cares in the world. So, 1992, I was obsessed with the Green Bay Packers and airplanes. And I didn't care very much about arthritis me medicine or economics. All right, so, um, so here we have recorded competitor, they have recorded did it again. Competitor advertisement in 24 territories, which is recorded in the variable competitor ads. All right, so we want to estimate this demand equation. Here's that ad dollars variable I was talking about. Here's our competitor ads variable, and here is our ad copy, which can be either emotional or rational. And so here we've got this multiple regression analysis, and we've got the results, right? So these are my, this is my intercept, this is my slope on ad dollars, this is my slope on competitor ads, this is my slope on ad copy. These are partial slopes. This is the effect of a $1 increase in advertising on my demand, on my quantity demanded, after controlling for competitor ads and for ad copy. That's the powerful, that's the power of multiple regression analysis so that these are partial slopes. This is the this is the ceteris paribus effect of an increase in ad dollars on on demand. It's captured by beta 1. Beta 2 is the Ceteris Paribus effect of an increase in competitor ads level after controlling for ad dollars and for ad copy. Clearly there's a lot of other things that are unobserved that are in the air term and so and so we kind of worry about that if we were doing this seriously but this is good enough for the classroom de demonstration. Uh, also the T stats you divide your slope you divide your coefficient by your uh, by your standard error 
and that'll give you your your t stat or you could divide your let's see, you could back up we could back out our standard errors if we wanted to these are not standard I, so i don't know so usually you'd have your slope coefficients and then you'd have your standard errors beneath them in parentheses and you divide the slope coefficient by the standard error to generate the t statistic here i've just given us our t statistic right so this would be if you're thinking about like doing the statistical analysis this is like the critical value we compare these at the 95 percent level or for like an alpha of 0 0.05 we compare these to a to a critical value of two and so these are my test statistics compare these to a critical value of two yeah competitor ads is statistically significant and 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 uh ad copy is statistic sorry ad, and uh ad dollars is statistically significant ad dollars actually not uh, at least not at the five percent level or well or even the ten percent level okay but that kind of gets beyond what we care about <laughs> so here's our results we're gonna actually just replace these values into the equation and now we've got something we can solve for the quantity for given levels of advertising dollars so i've done that here notice i've just taken i just took the table and i put these estimated coefficients into my equation right and now what I can do is we can think of what's the relevant advertising elasticity demand. Well, we're going to need to be able to find values for these two variables, but then we'll be able to get ad dollars and we'll be able to get the effect on demand coming through ad, ad dollars. We'll show that in a second. Obviously, this depends crucially on whether we think our competitors are going to respond to our advertising choices or not. And so we need some, we need some way to deal with competitor ads. Firstly, we're just going to take the average across all these months. Secondly, we're actually going to try to estimate competitors' ad response. So firstly, if you anticipate there's no response from the competitors, you'd set competitor ads the average over the time period. So in this case, for the duration of the experiment, it had been at a level of 19 in the demand equation. So I'm just going to replace competitor ads with 19. We're going to use emotional advertising copy, so I'll replace add copy with one and now I've got this equation that boils down to this right here oh that looks like an ordinary demand curve only rather than relating price and quantity it's relating ad dollars and quantity and this is gonna allow us to get our advertising elasticity right dqda well take this derivative with respect to a it's just gonna be this slope right here 1.48 and then our a oh that's our advertising level I told you already we're estimating this at 475 and then our quantity, our Q, this is specifically at this point, that's just gonna be drop in my 475 here, and it'd be 23.9 plus 1.48 times 475, that's this right here. And this gives me an advertising elasticity of 0.227. Computed at 475, and you could think about how that elasticity might be different if we computed this at 250 or at $8, which are also from our, right, which are also from our, from our study here. Okay, very good. So in terms of the interpretation, if the price elasticity of demand was minus two, no pain should be advertising approximately 10% of their sales, right? Okay, so advertising elasticity. So, all right, I wonder if this isn't gonna show up on the Zoom, so hopefully this works out, but we've got our 0.227 divided by point, whoops, divided by two is approximately 10% approximately of our sales, right? What was I doing there? I was doing this formula here. Right? So I took my advertising elasticity, 0.227, divided by my price elasticity demand of two, it came out, yes, uh, yeah, 11% uh, of sales, but okay, 10% of sales. All right, can we use our data to explain or to examine whether the competitors do respond to no pains ad levels and the, and the type of campaign? So here, let's estimate competitor ads. Suppose we had done that. Here we've got our intercept. Here we've got our ad dollars. Here we've got our ad copy. All right, so if competitors are gonna respond and our data suggests that they will, we can accommodate this by inserting their competitive response right into the demand equation. So rather than putting in 19 here, I'm just gonna put this whole expression in there. All right, so I've done this here. Now we get this nice expression that's only in terms of ad dollars and ad copy, both of which we control. Suppose we do that, let's see, we're gonna do the, uh, what was, we did our, Emotional ad copy, so here we will do our rational ad copy for zero. So we will drop we'll drop ad cop, drop in zero for ad copy. That's nice, this falls away. And now again, we've got this nice expression for uh, demand. And again, we can estimate our advertising elasticity. If we do that same as before, DQDA, oh, it's gonna be 0.99, and then estimating at an advertising level of 475. So A is 475, good, we get our 
get our expression here, and now we've estimated our advertising elasticity at 14, uh, 15, point, point 0.14, 8, point 0.15, whatever. And so our, again, if our price elasticity demand was 0.2, no pain should be advertising approximately 7.5% of sales. Oops, I'm get this here again. So we'd have, uh, what was that, 0.148 divided by two. Yeah, it's approximately 0.75 of sales. All right. So these are considerably dis uh, different results from those ignoring the competitive response, obviously, right? So yeah, it's gonna make sense. We're gonna wanna pay attention to how the competitor is gonna be responding. Uh, in both in terms of our ad copy and advertising amount. And so if you believe you're in an oligopoly, if you believe your, your rivals are gonna be responding, and indeed they are, I'm gonna think about how we're gonna deal with that. All right, so lastly, I wanna talk a little bit about advertising media and so how we make our decisions about where to advertise. We've got a lot of choices to make. You know, we can advertise online, we can have billboards, you can have print advertising over the radio, and we want to think about how to choose our how to choose our medium in order to maximize our advertising effectiveness. So this is often be done through different types of experiment. My best advice would be, you know, once you've done a particular, once you've gone a particular route for advertising, you want to do some post advertising survey to determine whether or not it's actually been as effective as, as you believe it to be. And there's some interesting anecdotes where this has not been the case. Uh, the other thing we can think about is being careful to target your advertisements, although this can be really expensive. So here's an example. Years ago, decades ago, this is super crude. I mean, the best you could do is try to put your advertisement where your customer was likely to encounter it, and you do sort of your best educated guess. Now you can target very specifically, such that your advertisement shows up specifically on the device of either somebody you've selected to receive that ad, or somebody who's self-selected into receiving that ad by virtue of having looked at whatever is the page. You notice that, like some websites you go to, you will see advertisements for things you were viewing days before. So like if I, you know, I'm gonna go buy a new coat or running shoes or something like that, then every website I go to subsequently has that coat and has those, has those shoes staring at me in the ads. And there's, yeah, you know, there's different settings to kind of get rid of that. Um, I don't know. So it could be sort of, on the, one, on the one hand, good for our entrepreneur to be able to find the customers. For the customers, it can be kind of obnoxious at times. I don't know how I feel about it. I guess my, my personal point of view is if I'm going to get bombarded by advertisements anyway, I want them to be relevant. I absolutely hate having to endure 30-second, 60-second, 90-second advertisements for medical stuff, for prescriptions, for whatever is the treating whatever when I'm trying to watch a <laughs> trying to stream some video I'm trying to you know watch a watch Netflix or um, a TV or whatever I've got to endure this advertisement that has no relevance to me for probably the next 40 years so yeah I'd much if you're gonna have advertisement I'd rather it be tar <laughs> it be targeted I don't know how you feel about that. Anyway, so here's looking at AdWords for the word insurance. If you're looking at the entire US, you get like 1,000 to 2,000 clicks for $100. For Michigan, now 150, 100 to 150 for $100. In Ann Arbor, five to 10 clicks for $100. Although if you're selling something locally, then you know maybe those are gonna be more valuable on the margin even than these obviously. And then Flint Sagan out 10 to 15 clicks for $100. So a couple things here. First off, you know, it's you're going to pay for the higher targeting. Second, you want to think about not over targeting your, your ad budget, especially you don't want to kind of be you don't want to sort of outthink, you know, out, outthink the system and get kind of too narrow where you're actually paying kind of a lot for a lot for a few advertisements uh, that are likely not increasing your visibility. So one of the things to kind of think about is like exactly how to do the targeting. There's a lot of different ways. You know, you do this with Facebook ads or Instagram ads or you know whatever is the case. If you're doing some type of some type of uh, uh, some type of advertisement, you want to think carefully about what's likely to get the advertisement near to your customer. And there's two types of things you want to do. One is you want to get the advertisement to the customer themselves ideally, or to somebody that will then bring it to the customer. All right, ultimately what you're trying to do is find the targeting that best corresponds to the segments that you're, act that you're actually anticipating, hoping to sell to. In order to do this, well, we've estimated our demand curve. Hopefully you know what the different demographics are at different points along the demand curve and you tailored your advertisement appropriately. 
Then with sponsored search advertising, yeah, there's a lot of different things you can do in terms of experimentation and data analysis. You can see what you have done. You can see what the response has been, varying your ad copy, your verbiage, varying the keywords that you're paying for, the, the specific targeting. And then ultimately, so make sure we, we want to pay attention to what's the actual conversion rate, not just the number of clicks. And so it's easy to get a lot of clicks. It's not as easy to get a lot of purchases, right? And so that's important to think about. All right, so a couple issues you want to think about is the way in which the, your advertising is going to affect both current and future demand. One of my one, one of the sort of favorite examples would be the advertisements for uh, Nemecolon Woodlands Resort when I lived in Pittsburgh, and they'd advertise year round, but then they do type of pulsing. They do a lot more advertisement during other during their you know, going into their peak season. And the reason why you want to do this is because your advertisement affects your current demand as well as your future demand in the sense of having whatever is that organization, that service, that product, kind of deep within the subconscious of your customer's mind can be really valuable such that when people are like, oh, I would like to go on a vacation somewhere. Where should I go? And then Nemecolon comes to your forefront of your mind, not because you heard an advertisement that day, but because you heard an advertisement six months ago. That's what you'd want, right? You'd want it. It'd be so. It'd be it's super effective when you can have this sort of insidious effect of advertising, such that the consumer believes that their choice to purchase your product or service is their own idea. All right. And so pulsing, yeah, advertising kind of throughout the year, but then increasing the amount during particular import, important times. And then another thing that's important, obviously, is doing some type of advertising post-survey uh, post survey or post-advertising analysis, data analysis. You want to do this carefully. Think about how you're actually cal collecting this data and how you're working on it. You can survey. You can do, like we talked about surveys to estimate your demand curve. You can survey your customers and ask how they found you. You want to do that carefully. So I remember there's some medical providers that we were, uh, that we were going to, and uh, they asked us before the, before the exam how we found them. <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, via Google and then looking at, you know, physicians reviews and so on and so forth. And, but, and so this is probably valuable information for them because then they get to learn how their customers found them. However, it did plant the seed in my mind, which is like, why are you asking that question? Is it so surprising that we found your practice that you have to ask? And so then that, so you want to think carefully about how you ask these, ask, ask questions in terms of like, how, how do you, how did you find us? Because anytime, I get one of these, how did you find us advert uh, questions? I always think, what, what's different about me? Did I do something like, should I not have found you? If I was, if I was more normal, would I not have found you? Right? So anyway, hope you enjoyed the video and I will, I will see you for the next one.